Our world is lost in unnecessary fear and hurt. Our systems seem scientifically engineered to make you small, powerless, and always waiting for the next great leader who will fix the problems around us. Worse, we're witnessing neighbor versus neighbor while warfare breaks out around our family tables. But you have access to a spirit, a strength that enlarges and empowers you. Even better, you don't need to wait for the next big movement. You can heal the world. It's time for governance by grace. Welcome to Grace Archy with Jim Babka. You know, I, Jim, I've just got to say right up front, uh, well, maybe I should tell everybody, Jim's working on these next few episodes for quite a while, and uh, <laughs> like maybe a lifetime. <laughs> no pressure there. But but here's the thing. Uh, Jim knows a lot of stuff that he's going to be sharing with me for the first time. And I think the most effective way to do this, because it could be like, you know, four or five parts by the time we're all done, is for me to play the audience, basically, and for Professor Babka to join us in the room and uh, explain <laughs> over the course. <laughs> you know, that's two episodes in a row that you've given me some high elevated title. Man, somebody's got to do it, and our listeners next, aren't. Right next there episode, yet. I'm coming with a clerical collar. You watch. Okay. I, I, I will. <laughs> that's your promise, people. Maybe I'll get out my narrow jacket. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> yes. So anyway, I propose to look. If, I'm the, if I play the audience, basically, because there is so much about what you're going to share that is going to be new to me, too, uh, and just sort of resonate for what it is that you're saying, ask questions when I'm lost, um, we'll go through the material and then see if that works as more of a classroom environment rather, rather than a couple of guys, you know, podcasting together. Okay. Should we tell them what we're going to talk about, though? I saved, I saved that one for you, my friend. <laughs> okay. I want to talk about conspiracy theory. It is a place where angels fear to tread, to go out and start to begin to talk about uh, the existence of conspiracy theories, the importance of conspiracy theories, and, and why you should take some conspiracy theories seriously. Yeah, this makes sense to me because we are overwhelmed, you know, as a, as a civilization now. Yeah, we haven't really known which direction is up. And events of late have uh, maybe calling certain things into question. How, yeah. How's that? Okay. And, so, and, and events of late. So let's put a let's put a calendar mark on this because it is December of 2023 in America. Yes. Yes. And uh, you can, and if, if you're listening, watching this, uh, just take your own timeline and put us in in that moment, and you'll have the context that Jim wants to speak to you about today. Yeah. So. The episodes that I want to do first, before I think you can discuss any specific conspiracy theory, I think you need some rules of the road in terms sure, of yeah. how to analyze. Definitely. And there's a lot of garbage out there, which we're going to talk about as well. And so what I want to do is I want to kind of start to lay out maybe a philosophy of conspiracy theory. And if, in fact, I think the place to start is how to handle conspiracy theories. Yes. Okay. I was going through the notes and, and they're it's really well structured people. So, uh, you know, take this one at a time. We'll go through yeah. and you'll so, really get it. So we want to start at the beginning. Conspiracy theory is a relatively new term. There are people in this audience right now. I don't, I'm, I'm just barely young enough for this not to be true, but the term was invented in your lifetime. There, there was no such thing as conspiracy theorists until the Kennedy assassination. Previous to that, it, it wouldn't have even been, nobody would have thought to have used a term like this. And, and in part, they wouldn't have thought to do it because prosecutors assume there are conspiracies all the time. That's their job. Detectives do it. This is part of the job of doing uh, investigative work when you believe a crime has been committed. So, and, and let's be candid about this. Why don't we call it a conspiracy theory when someone's throwing a surprise birthday party? It's meant to be an ugly pejorative term. So when I when I started uh, thinking about a philosophy and specifically how to handle conspiracy theories, part of my thinking is inspired by Edward Snowden. He has a blog that doesn't have a whole lot on Substack. He doesn't have a whole lot of columns on it. 
And he promised to write an entire series on this, but near as I can tell, only wrote one column. Uh, and he decided that the place to start was a taxonomy of conspiracies. And we'll provide the link in the show notes. That's where I decided to begin to. Um, he defines conspiracy theories. He says about conspiracy theories, quote, conspiracy theories do not inculcate powerlessness so much as they are signs and symptoms of powerlessness itself. And I start there and I grab that quote and it jumps out at me, Bill, because we're gray Sarkey after all. Right. Yeah, I, I, I resonated for that. And, you know, I'm, I, I'm a Snowden kind of acolyte. I use yeah. the term loosely. So yeah, yeah it really, it, it caught me by surprise, man. Yeah, so this is a, when you see people, I, I just want to put a heavy emphasis on this because we're gray Sarkey. When you see people saying a conspiracy did this or a conspiracy did that, or they're out to get us, then that comes from a place where they don't feel empowered. They feel that something has happened. Yes. And, and, and gaslighting is a closely related phenomenon. So... I don't want to start off blaming conspiracy theorists for believing in conspiracies, even when they're in error. I want to understand what it was emotionally that brought them to the place where they think, well, you know, I'm going to believe in something that's really out in left field because believing in something that's out in left field does not win you friends and influence people. It does yeah, not expand your relationship. It does not make you happier. Yeah. Okay. This really got my attention. So yes. Because we all come with our sets of beliefs, right? I have all of mine, and some of them are genuine conspiracies in the way that you'll explain, and some of them are wild-ass things that have no basis in fact. Right. So now continuing with Snowden's approach to this here, uh, I think there are, we can draw a distinction between conspiracy practices and conspiracy theories. Yeah, this is good. Help me explain. Conspiracies occur. The, the, this, the, this is just metaphysically certain there are conspiracies. So like, you know, for example, there's very little debate uh, in the history of political assassinations that Abraham Lincoln's assassination was a conspiracy. And we actually know who the names of the conspirators were for the most part and what their roles were. Uh, part of the reason that we know this is because the secretary of state in that particular situation was assassinated or an attempted assassination was done on him the very same night that there was the assassination of Abraham Lincoln. Secretary Stewart had his house invaded by Louis Payne, who proceeded to get into the house and in front of Payne's daughter, repeatedly stabbed uh, Seward, and then jumped out of the house and ran off and got away. Ultimately, he's captured, and he's one of four people that ends up getting hung uh, as a result of their uh, involvement in the conspiracy plot. Now, there are debate. there's debate as to whether or not Mary Surratt was actually a conspirator deserving of the death penalty. But there's not really a debate whether or not there was a conspiracy. Yes, I see. Okay. Snowden says conspiracy practices tend to be banal. They tend to be practiced in the open. And even well-respected politicians, technologists, and financiers express them. They, stay, they stand up and say the conspiracy to you right out loud. And they rarely meet with real opposition or the opposition is part of some formal debate that we choose to have as a country. Can you give an example? Just gerrymanders. That's a conspiracy. Uh, so the gerrymander is where they draw congressional lines and your congressman chooses you or your part, the party more specifically chooses it's, it gets a seat that it gets to kind of, you know, assemble all the voters so that Democrats have a certain number of seats. Republicans have a certain number of seats. It's divided up based on looking at the map. They draw the lines in very bizarre fashions and they split. They split the loot of voters, so to speak. That's yes. an open conspiracy. It's yeah. banal. We it's all know practice that's, that's in the how, open. That's how it works, right? That's okay. what we do. Yeah. Mass surveillance. Mass surveillance. So if you have one of these in your pocket, okay, the things that this thing knows about you are absolutely incredible. So let's say you go to the store and you buy some milk and on the way home, you stop at the Harley Davidson to check out a bike. Then the Harley Davidson dealer can go and they can say, oh, you know what? Um, we would like to know where Bill, where our customers were 
let's put it more generally, we'd like to know where our customers were before they come to the Harley Davidson dealership. Right. And that information's available. Now they don't really care, Bill, that it's you specifically. And I'm not really super yeah. concerned about most of what commercial entities know about us. But you know what? The state's involved in this right down, I mean, down deep. They got backdoors in all of this stuff. They make it so it's the law that they have backdoors in all this stuff. They also further bribe these businesses to get the backdoor to this stuff. This is an open conspiracy. And, and the reason it's not an irony that I'm bringing this up because we're talking about Edward Snowden's take about conspiracies. Right. Admiral James Clapper argue, he's the head of uh, national intelligence, saw him lie to Congress saying the surveillance wasn't going on. And previous to that, he saw a record number of whistleblowers prosecuted by the Obama administration under the Espionage Act. And he said, somebody's got to tell the truth to the world. We can't go through channels here. There was no alternative, and that's what he did. And he reported everybody in mass surveillance. And frankly, this article expresses his disappointment that more people didn't care about the fact that they were being monitored in every single way, every single day. That's been my experience, too, on the telecom side. It's open. Everybody knows. Yeah. And they don't care. And right? they don't care. They don't care. Now, oh, and, if I show they, oh, <laughs> they don't care until they want to suppress something. Well, I'll tell you what. If I show up at your house and I start filming the front door of it, you start to get really upset and suspicious. What the hell are you doing? Right? Yeah. Yeah. But we let the government do this all day, every day, inside our homes. Now, um, conspiracy theories are, uh, it, un, under his definition, are malevolent falsehoods that in the aggregate can erode civic confidence in the existence of anything certain or verifiable. Let me put that in just plain English. People stop believing what the authorities say because of conspiracy theories. And he believes that the state is involved routinely in propagating conspiracy theories. He goes on to write, I couldn't help but notice that the conspiracies that garnered almost as much attention were those that were demonstrably false. Right? That's That really got my attention right there. I was, it was claimed, a hand-picked CIA operative sent to infiltrate and embarrass the NSA. And by the way, this is the kind of stuff that the establishment people were like whispering. They weren't saying loud. They were whispering it. You know, he's he went to China. He went to China. Did you notice how he fled to China? He must yep. have. He must be with the Chinese. Oh, wait, wait. He's in Russia now. He's with Putin. Yes, it's a Russian plot, right? They said it. And then other people start picking up and playing on it. And, and in fact, one, in a very funny way, I, it, we'll put the link in the notes. Go look at the picture he has. <laughs> in okay, the, it's, uh, hilarious. it's hilarious. He said, my actions were part of an elaborate interagency feud. Others said my true masters were the Russians, the Chinese, or worse, Facebook. So he thinks this: these are conspiracy fantasies. Demonstrably false. Design, and they, their result is they erode confidence that anything can be certain or verifiable. And he, he said he was very frustrated by this. He said, I wanted to scream, what is wrong with you people? All you want is intrigue. But an honest to God, globe-spanning apparatus of omnipresent surveillance riding in your pocket is not enough? You have to sauce that up? I, so I, I want to throw in on this, but I'm going to hold it for later because it's a decent question. So just note that this moment, I have a question. If you're listening, you have the same one. <laughs> Go ahead. No, no, let's do it. Let's do it right now. Truth doesn't sell, Jim. I'm no. running a media empire here. I can't yeah. print the truth. Nobody will buy from me. Well, and it's not just it's not just the people. It, it, this is actually a human trait that he's describing as well. It's not just the media that's doing this. It's it's all kinds of people who need to sauce the thing up. I was and, keeping and, it third party. I didn't want to point fingers. Well, and and, and I want to you know it's interesting because um, when something happens and you start to discuss these conspiracies. And there's a real conspiracy that's actually happening. It's a conspiracy practice, not a theory. Yeah. People almost always want to go to motive. They want the details of how it went down, and you may not have all those details. And they want the motive of the participants. And they care about that more than they actually care about the evidence that's actually available. It's sure, almost like, because, well, okay. All right. So I'll you know that, that, yeah. So you know that John Wilkes Booth shot Abraham Lincoln, but why? Right. And, and, and they're starting when they do this to get into a state of conjecture. And the further that you get from uh, kind of the legal sense of these things, the yeah. stuff that is verifiable could be factual. The further you get from that, 
the more naturally speculative and the more error prone you get. Well, anybody that's ever shot a gun or an arrow knows that if you're only off by a tiny fraction of an inch at the start, that you end off in the distance being much, much further off. And, and so speculation is a dangerous place to go. And as we discuss on this show in the future, the nature, uh, actual conspiracies, I will be at pains to avoid getting into uh, speculation, particularly when I have not said up front, I'm speculating. I don't know. And I can't prove what I'm saying. I just have maybe this hunch or this belief. And that's all that can be said for it. You can't say more. So you just have to be really, really careful about this. You have to be very clear about this. And you probably should tend to hold yourself back when it comes to speculating. Now, he he says that um, part of the reason that this happens as well is that, and, and I, I've been studying one particular conspiracy theory for the last year, and he says that one of the reasons is it's very daunting. And I cannot, until you've actually studied some, one of these things at length, you you don't understand what that's you don't understand the gravity of that statement of that of that idea. It, it, you mean it's, complexity? The complexity is vast, and it turns out the things that you need to know about the thing. So I, I'm going to keep going back to Lincoln because that is a very clear presidential assassination that was a conspiracy. Um, what did John Wilkes Booth say when he jumped off the stage? Well, we have lots of eyewitnesses for that thing. What did John Wilkes Booth say when he was? when he got to Samuel Mudd's house. Well, we only have Samuel Mudd's story, and Samuel Mudd got convicted. He was a doctor that treated him. He got convicted, uh, and I think there's a debate as to whether or not that should have happened as well, but he got treated as an accessory to the crime. And what did they say between each other? Well, Mudd has reason to try to get himself out of trouble. Sure. And we don't yeah. have as much information about the relationship between Booth and Mudd at that hour. So, and then there's a whole host of things that you would start to get into about, you know, time and place and custom and how this or that worked, right? You know, did somebody get on the bus or didn't they get on the bus, right? And if they got on the bus, where was it going? Like, there's a ton of things. And then you have to start looking up the old bus lines. I mean, it, it, it gets really, really difficult to go back to transport yourself into a time and place and know all the relevant details about something to find out whether or not what you're being told is actually factual, accurate, true. Right. So it sure. is daunting. Yeah. Okay. So from there, Snowden starts to get into ta ta various taxonomies. Okay. So um, just a quick question here. So yes. he means that he's, he's going to classify conspiracy in some fundamental way that, you know, your average guy on the street can understand, right? No, I think actually the opposite here. I think it's, he's, this is again about how to analyze conspiracies, how to, how to deal with them. Got it. Okay. So and I think it's helpful. Still. It's, it's helpful to be able to categorize what type they are. He suggests that people uh, seek often to replace histories with parochial or partisan stories that prepare the stage for some type of political upheaval. Now, when I say upheaval, and he uses upheaval, I, I want to I caution that this is often goes under the, a not much more pleasant title called historical revisionism. And it turns out that historical revisionism is actually a valuable subject because it is fundamentally true that history is written by the winners. And history is controlled by establishment gatekeepers. Now, that it is not automatic for my libertarian friends that the establishment's wrong. And I wouldn't always bet on that. That'd be a mistake to do that. But it it is the case that when if you if that a lot of times if you want to change the direction that a culture or society is going and you think it's going the wrong direction, one of the things you're going to have to do is begin to look at the history. Now we watched Perry Willis not once but twice now in the history of Grace Arkey do something that he did for the Zero Aggression Project. Uh, we have art articles up at WarTruth.org that talk about the history of U.S. interventions, wars. Why did we get into those wars? What did we do in those wars? Did they make you safer? Did they make the world better off, et cetera? He asked four key questions about that. 
And the information that he brings to the table is in books, it's factual, but it is not the establishment position. It is historical revisionism. That's something that serves a valuable purpose. Now on the flip side of this thing, all the way on the very other end of the crazy extreme, there are people who believe that the earth is flat and I don't believe it for a second. I'm talking about the fact that people actually believe this. Now, there's two stages to this. There are, it turns out, people who believe this, but they didn't start out that way. They started off initially as kind of a fun parlor game. But if you start to believe in a particular conspiracy, and I choose this one because it's one of the more extreme ones. If you start to believe in a particular conspiracy theory, you do it kind of the, the same reason that gangs have colors. It tells people you're on the team. You identify with the team. And if you will take a, a conspiracy theory far enough, if you will start to provide an, enough intellectual heft to support it, then that really shows that you are purely devoted to that team. The further you will go out on a limb on these issues, the more devoted, the more loyal, the more part of the tribe you are. And the conflict machine plays with this. Our political system play with this. There are times when there is a blatant attempt by the, the regime media, by political actors playing in the field to get people to go off on their loony cards. So in the Obama administration, in the early part of the Obama administration, there was a vast conspiracy that Obama was not an American. And the importance of that statement was that if you would pick up and run with that, and a lot of people did, because it showed tribal affiliation. They didn't really have any detailed facts. There were people, that, though, that started going out and putting together evidence for this because it said something bigger about Obama and it said something very much about us, if we believe that. The people that believe that. The same thing happened during, I don't want to just pick on the, the, the right here, the same thing happened on the political left with the Russiagate, with all the Russian material that was put out. Rachel Maddow did show after show after show, night after night after night, breathlessly presenting some new piece of conspiracy theory evidence. And people signed on to that. Now, over time, and if enough people start to sign on to something, pretty soon it does start to be believed culturally. It becomes part of what you have to play along with and believe. If you start to question the conspiracy theory, you can't be trusted. And people know this. And so they start to join in. Maybe they even get their hopes up in a situation like this. What I think we should always be doing if we are interested in grace, if we are looking to bring grace to the situation, is that our first commitment should always be to the truth, wherever it leads. And that includes if it leads somewhere that our team, our side, doesn't like. So I get you about this, uh, analyzing it for the truth. That, that makes a lot of sense to me. And that... I mean, if you do that, it could lead to a very interesting place or it could be a total dead end. Mm -hmm. And you might lose everything, like your existential tribe would be gone if you suddenly decided that the earth was round again and you'd been a exactly. flat earther. Exactly. So the you, risk you of that. It. Yep. <laughs> you know, the truth it's is real. risky. The truth is risky. And that's why you need great you need the ennobling of grace in order to be able to to, to really do that. I think grace and truth walk together. All right, so let's look at some of these taxonomies that uh, Edward Snowden laid out, and you know maybe we'll even go be a, a bit beyond that. But I want to start with one that's being I'm seeing used around the, the web uh, by Jesse Walker. He's an editor at Reason. He wrote The United States of Paranoia, A Conspiracy Theory. About 10 years ago, he issued this book. And he has five categories, Bill. The first one is The Enemy Outside, which is described as conspiracies perpetrated by or based on actors scheming against an identity community from outside of it. Let's give an example to make that more concrete. Saddam Hussein is going to nuke an American city. That's the conspiracy theory. That's an enemy outside version. Yeah. And there's the enemy within. So conspiracies are perpetrated by or based on actors scheming against a given identity community with, in, from inside of it. So this would be something like uh, LGBT people are... are teaching in our schools to indoctrinate our children. That's their plan. They want to convert all of them to also be LGBT. That's an enemy within conspiracy theory. Yeah, I understand. Then there's an, then there's an enemy above. 
Uh, these are conspiracies perpetrated by or based on actors manipulating events from within the circles of power. So Lyndon Johnson was behind the Kennedy conspiracy, uh, the, the Kennedy conspiracy, the, the, the plot to murder John F. Kennedy. Lyndon Johnson was behind it. That would be an enemy above scenario where he organized the entire plot. An enemy below also exists, and these are conspiracies perpetrated by or based on actors from historically disenfranchised communities seeking to overturn the social order. Uh, this could be the riots in 2020 that were allegedly the result of Black Lives Matter. Black yeah, Lives Matter endorsed that. these riots. Yeah. Okay, that would be uh, one. Uh, what, let's make sure we have some balance since these events are so current. The 2021 insurrection that somehow or other there was a massive plot to overthrow the results of the election and that the invasion of the Capitol was a coordinated planned exercise uh, designed by the people who participated in it to overthrow the government. The rioters were not associated with Black Lives Matter and the evidence is still out. We still have to look at the case, but the this was unlikely an insurrection. Um, you, your mileage may vary on both of these questions, but I just want to say these are enemy below conspiracies. Then benevolent conspiracies. These are extraterrestrial or supernatural or religious forces. God himself doing something dedicated to controlling the world, mo usually for humanity's benefit. Um, and, and, uh, uh, an example of this might be, uh, th there's a guy, and I, his name escapes me at the moment, but he basically posited that a long time ago, UF, uh, alien civilizations came to our planet, gave us technology. They helped us master oh, technology, sure. right? Yep. Um, I've heard this one. Yep. Yeah. And so this is, this too is a, 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 this is a benevolent conspiracy, uh, that comes from beyond. It's not a human being necessarily. It does it. It's, it's one of the gods as it were. So those are the Walker ones. Now let's move on. Michael Barkun came up with a completely different uh, taxonomy. Very different. There were event conspiracies. Greatest example of these are false flag conspiracies. Sure. Yeah. There are systemic conspiracies. Uh, the one that uh, the example that Snowden offers of this is the uh, Freemasons, right? There's a system that's trying to control things. Then there are supernatural, uh, super conspiracy theories, excuse me, like the New World Order. This is like, you know, it's all over. It's the whole planet. It's global uh, in nature. Um, so that was uh, Michael Barkun. Murray Rothbard, uh, he basically divided conspiracies into two types. Uh, he suggested that uh, they were shallow conspiracies. They identify, you identify evidence of wrongdoing and blame the party that benefits. Oh, sure. Don't Follow the money. Okay, so you don't necessarily need to have all the evidence. You can start to say, well, you know, we, I got a problem with that guy over there. And I notice he's really, this conspiracy has really benefited him. <laughs> then a deep conspiracy, you suspect the party of wrongdoing and continue by seeking out documentary proof. Is this deep state kind of thing? No, 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 no. This is about actually having documented proof of the activity. So on okay. the shallow conspiracy, what's happening is you just simply say so-and-so benefits. They must be to blame. Yeah. On the deep conspiracy, you actually have gone into and gotten research and pulled out information. So that would be like a, a Kennedy assassination kind of a thing. I actually think it would be um, because... One of the things that the Kennedy conspiracy field could be noted for is the plethora, I mean, the just deluge of books and articles that have been written about various aspects of what happened uh, in the 1960s in our government, it, what happened in November of 1963, what specifically happened on the 22nd and 23rd and 24th of November, what happened in the Warren Commission, what happened in the House Assassinations Committee, and so on and so on down the line. There are, there are people who have gone in and they've just been experts on single things in that, and they have dug, 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 dug for research. Yeah. Yeah. Right. But I hear people all the time. I have uh, people in my life that will blame the Democrats for something because the Democrats benefit from it. Right. Right. And it's interesting, you know, the the Democrats have become very obsessed, very obsessed with electoral integrity. 
I mean, we we you are you a are you a demo, dem, democracy denier? Are you an electoral denier? Because you deny the outcome of the or the result of the 2020 election. Stacey Abrams lost her Senate seat in 2018. Hillary Clinton lost the presidency in 2016. And after both events, those candidates made specific election denial statements. Stacey Abrams was convinced her election had been stolen from her. And the Democratic Party was all for it. Now, I recognize 2018 is ancient history. We, 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 were, we were, but we weren't even a thought, a gleam in our father's eye back then, right? I mean, it's so, so long ago that we can't possibly remember it, but we can all remember 2020 and 2021 when Donald Trump was denying. So these are these are surface conspiracies. We see that one side benefit and we think, well, they must have cheated. Now, I'm with you on end, that. I'm with you on that. Go ahead. I, uh, we have how many different ways of, of typing a conspiracy? One, two, three, four, five. We have three. I've got three of them. We have just has got five. Ma uh, Michael Barcoon has th uh, three, three, and Murray has two. Okay, so boil it down for us, and let's. Well, let's, you know, it's funny because Edward Snowden had his own version of, of looking well, at all of this. Right. Yeah, his was. Similar. And he said. Uh, he wasn't sure that any mode of classification could adequately address the the alternate, depending nature of conspiracies. Yep. yep. Right. So uh, there's you could have a true conspiracy, which was there was a from his possession there was a, there were nine eleven hijackers that triggers a false conspiracy that nine eleven was an inside job, it was planned by you know George Bush and Dick Cheney, right? Right. Uh, and I mean, if you know George Bush planned something, I don't know. Anyway, and a false <laughs> right. conspiracy. Uh, Iraq has weapons of mass destruction that triggers a true conspiracy, which was the invasion of Iraq. And in other words, it was not true. Our government was lying about the fact that there was weapons of mass destruction. That was a conspiracy. It was a false conspiracy. And it triggered a, it was based on a true conspiracy that was happening in front of us in real time, which was the attempt to get us to go to war with Iraq. So he, he's like, this is a very hard thing to juggle. Yeah. But I think it's still at the end of the day, a good exercise. And I'm glad that he still walked his audience through it and that we've now walked ours through it because it shows that conspiracies are not just of one type and maybe yeah. different tools are going to need to be analyzed in each case. Oh, you mean but I just I, can't think one way and get it right every time? No. And I, at the end of the day, I would say that Murray Rothbard's is one I kind of favor. I kind of like the idea that some are shallow and some are deep. And when I see people make shallow claims, and here's the thing you can ask for all the time. Can I have the footnotes, please? Can I have the reference? Can I have the article? Where's the proof? Where are yes. the documents? Wikipedia? Yeah. I mean, can you get me anything? Just, just give me something I can run with. Yeah. One of the people who watches our show regularly will know he's, I'm referencing a conversation we just had today. <laughs> You know, he talked about something we talked about in a previous episode called the Gish Gallop, right? Yep. Which is where you, you you just lay a parade of statements on so that yep. so that no one, if you were to try to take them apart one at a time, it would take forever to do it. You just yep. layer them all on top. Just throw them as fast as you possibly can, like a blizzard. And that way you don't have to deal with the truth claims in the situation. But we should slow down and ask for the footnotes. We should sh slow down and ask for the references. And the mere fact that you have a suspicion, shallow, or that you see somebody apparently benefiting, shallow, does not necessarily constitute a real conspiracy. It's a, yeah. It might be yeah. a theory instead of a practice. So I, at the end of the day, truth is what I think matters the most. Yeah, getting to that. Uh, caveat from my last question is that it's very difficult and risky to get to the truth, and it doesn't sell when you do. Or you could wind up like Edward Snowden with a nice comfy cell somewhere in Russia. I'm glad you said that. I think Grace... I've been critical of people in a theological setting who have suggested that grace is easy. It's the easy path, right? Oh, you just have a God that loves, right? And he doesn't hold anybody accountable for anything, right? 
where's your hell? Where's judgment? Where's this? Where's his anger? Where's his wrath? Right? That somehow or other, this is the easier part. And I would suggest that actually grace is the harder part. It's the taking up your cross part. Edward Snowden gave up his life because truth mattered to him. He gave up the comfort of being able to live a normal, quiet life in the United States of America, having you know all the normal things that we do here. He's in a foreign land all this time. He cannot be at family gatherings. He can't get together with friend, his friends back home. He can't enjoy a lot of American creature comforts. He has to live in a foreign territory all this time. And it's wrong. Julian Assange has put himself, he, uh, we're going to talk about Julian as well, because we've got to, um, but Julian Assange has put himself out on the line because the truth mattered. So telling the truth is an extraordinary act that can cost you everything. Like people hold it up as a noble value. Oh, I'm, you know, I believe in telling the truth, but do you really, if you were called upon to do it and you knew it was going to cost you something big? would you still tell the truth? And I think it requires a state of grace to be able to do that. Well, so now, so let's wrap this up and make this a grace archy issue completely. Okay. Yes. We yes. always come to the grace points at the end of the show. And I actually want to spend the last couple minutes here, a few minutes uh, talking about this. I wrote an article for an uh, an aborted project. It, it was an experiment that lasted about a half a year, but it's the way you and I met, Bill. It's called the Exit Network. And there we dealt with how the conflict machine works. And I wrote an article there called How to Find the Best Conspiracy Theories. We will put that link in the show notes as well. And I've come away with what I think are four steps that we should follow. First one is be humble. If you're looking at a conspiracy, either side of it, whether you disbelieve or believe, be humble. And this is based on the recognition that there are more ways to be wrong than to be right. Yes, a very important point. There are more ways to be wrong than to be right. Right is a narrow path. Wrong is broad and goes many different directions. Um, knowledge itself is hard to, it, I mean, you, you, we have a lot of resources to gain knowledge, but it's still to get us to the bottom of something to really, really know it is hard while error is incredibly easy to do. You can just make a guess, right? Any, any, anybody with a fart can go any direction they want, right? To really study, to really know something takes time, takes effort. Uncovering the truth is a practice and a responsibility. I like legal said practice. Like it, you have to learn. It takes, you know, it takes practice. You actually have to work at it to get better at discerning the truth. Okay, and um, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Sure. Uh, I'm going to be maybe putting me on the spot because I am going to add, I'm going to violate the legal rule of asking a question to which I don't necessarily know the answer. No, this was not scripted in advance. Uh, gosh, I hope I get the answer right. Have I more than once, multiple times, have I said to you, I'm not ready to discuss X or Y on this show? Oh, absolutely. Uh, you know, the audience doesn't know about all the back end that goes on with this, but we will literally never go live. Is literally the right word to use there? Yeah. You know, I think it is. I think it is. Uh, until we're ready. Until we're ready. Yeah. That is so important right now because, you know, in terms of broadcast, of which we are a very small but tiny part, um, there's an ethical responsibility. Mm -hmm. And I feel that keenly. speak the truth. I feel it keenly. So I come to these situations, you know, there's this phenomenon, I believe it's called Dunning-Kruger, but I would explain it this way. You go up this, 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 this slope of knowledge, and at the very beginning, it's, when you're first learning a new subject, it's really steep. You're like, man, I'm learning so much about this. I'm going to lick this thing. And you start to get your own ideas and hypotheses about how it's all going to work. And, and you're just convinced you know what you're talking about. And then right when you go to test those things, if you go to that step, because not everybody gets there, and you test that, and you start to look over the precipice, 
and you realize that there is a huge valley and you go right back down because you suddenly realize you don't know much at all. So I was, like everybody else was, once much younger than I am now and thought I knew more than what I actually knew. And I wouldn't have been in a position 20, 25 years ago to sit behind a mic and do what I do now. Could not have done it. I might have thought I could, but I hadn't done enough homework yet. And I, ha I had a conversation uh, months ago, maybe a year ago, with somebody who was still in their 20s. And they're like, you know, I don't know how to get to the point where you know all the things that you know. Like, uh, like I'm trying to figure out how to do that. And I'm like, it's time. It's time. You can't, there's, to some degree, this cannot be cheated. I mean, you can study hard on a given subject, but uh, to develop a, a breadth of, of information, you actually have to do the homework and it's going to just take time. Yep. Years. Okay. But let's get back to this idea about humility specifically. And that is our legal system requires a presumption of innocence and a unanimous verdict for this very reason. Because error is easy and truth is hard. Guessing is easy. Study is hard. Scientists use double-blind trials, peer review, and statistical analysis. They pretend to do the same things, by the way, when they're doing their job wrong. But, but <laughs> all kidding aside... This is what they're supposed to do. And all of these are designed to squeeze out error because error is contaminating everything. Yeah. You need, you need to have sustainable evidence like, that can be repeated. Okay. So now when it comes to conspiracy theories, presume in innocence, particularly for the side you don't like. That's the grace point for this one. Be humble. Presume in innocence. Hold your conspiracy theory very loosely and provisionally until you have sufficient actual evidence to make the claim. Number two, you should recognize that you have a bias. Oh, sure. Absolutely. Just like okay. you start to learn stuff and you all of a sudden you think you know it all. We're right back to where we started. Conspiracy theories are frequently a form of, of therapy, really, for the frustrated mm -hmm. and the powerless. And they seem to conform, uh, this is an odd coincidence, to just how terrible one's enemies are. Did you know that how bad those Republicans are? How terrible those Republicans are? Why, just the other day they did this, right? Right. And the conspiracy theories tend to prove they were as awful as we thought they were. These arguments tend to get a little bit circular. It goes something like this. It appears something evil has happened. And only someone as bad as my enemy would do something so heinous. Therefore, my enemy must be responsible. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> Try that one in a court of law. I saw this phrase. I do not know where I got it. I wish I could attribute it to the person that I got it from, but I had to write, I, but I did write it down in time. At least I got the phrase. I would call this a morality legend. Ha. <laughs> any parents listening here? Any parents in the room right now? <laughs> Does this work with you when your kid comes? Uh, Bobby did this terrible thing. Yes. Your brother wouldn't do that, would he? Well, you're right. We see this in, in personal relationships. You know, uh, you'll hear someone say something like, you know, Bob meant to harm me. He would sell out his mother. Right. right. Um, and if you, you know, the thing is that what kind of the other things that comes with age, you live long enough, you start to recognize Bob wasn't thinking about you when he messed you up. You weren't on his radar at all. Yeah, Bob was obsessed with his own problems, trying to figure out his own situation, pursuing yeah. his own happiness. Imagine that. Yeah. And, and yeah. Okay. So it, you know, what he did ended up hurting you, but you're making a federal crime. Like you lay awake at night. I used to have somebody a long time ago who used to say, you lay awake at night trying to think of ways to, you know, torture me. And I said, I was a teenager at the time. I said, I don't think about you at all. <laughs> right. <laughs> so causation and intention are both hard to prove. And if you don't believe me, ask a scientist, ask a prosecutor. And your inherent bias makes you vulnerable to making unjust accusations about real people with real lives and so their the family. Grace, the grace point here is, is uh, check your judgment at the door. Yes. Recognize you have a bias, but let's do one other thing. Let's take that recognition now to step three, which yes. is the steel man. And we have talked about steel manning a lot in this podcast. This, oh, is, done a, it. this is a grace practice. Now, a steel man 
argument is the opposite of a straw man argument. And I am one of the people in the world right now who is dedicated to spreading the concept of steel manning. I discovered this a couple of years ago. Other people were using it. And I was like, this is a term that needs to get widespread currency. Everybody needs to understand what it is to steel man. And they need to start doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Don't straw man other people's arguments. And what the way that works is you put the easiest to defeat words in your opponent's mouth, and then you light them on fire in front of everybody. You take the weakest, smallest arguments and you defeat them. Yeah. Okay. I, what you do instead is try to find out what they would actually say, because they're going to tend to give you what they believe are their best arguments. And in fact, even amongst the people that argue, ignore the weaker ones and go to the stronger ones, go to the people that put forth the very best arguments. Yeah. And then refute those. And you want to do the same thing in a conspiracy context. You don't want to present something that you have not taken the time to figure out, hey, wait a minute, what's the best argument against this? Okay, I have to tell you, in looking at conspiracies themselves and wanting to discuss them here and helping people see how to do this, I have to tell you, we always have a clock. And it's always burning against me as I'm sitting here because I know... <laughs> That the number of people who will listen to the show has a lot to do with them looking at that little number in the bottom right-hand corner of the frame and making a decision. Well, I don't know. I have 26 minutes right now. But if I go 56 minutes, oh, I don't think I have 56 minutes right now. And I know that that, exi that difference exists and it causes a large fall off in a number of people that will choose to start listening to the show. Because once you get here and you start listening to my golden dose of tones and my brilliant logic, you cannot possibly escape. You have to no, finish. You're, you're right. done. You're and, done. And we're, and we're watching you to make sure that you are. Yes. But <laughs> getting started has a lot to do with that number in the bottom right-hand corner. If you take the time first to research that delays when you even get the broadcast done, but, but, but if you take the time to explain the steel man argument to things, it is naturally lengthens the broadcast or your argument. And it's hard to get that stuff in. In a world where we're full of sound bites, where interviews on television last six minutes on average, yeah, it's hard to get your points across if you're spending the time steel manning your opponent's position. But it's necessary. But you still, but you still got to do it. It's It's got to be done. And, it, and it's a... It's against practice. You know, you won't get it right the first time. But keep right. trying. All right. Step four. Practice the philosophy of human respect. So how do I apply this to conspiracy theories? Because this has to do with material harm. Conspiracy theories exist on all sides. Every, every group's got them. I don't care what group you name for me right now. They've all got one. At least one. Probably more than one and politicians of all parties traffic in them. The media promotes them, and conspiracies help drive the conflict machine, the entire political process. They're used by the permanent political class in particular to keep us at each other's throats and divide us into warring tribes. Now, conspiracy theorists themselves typically want politicians and prosecutors and others to do things. Do something. I demand you take action. We need a policy. We need you to take to proactively grab control of this thing and use the force and power that you have to get other people to do what I believe needs to be done right now. But okay. government employees have no other tool in their kit that really matters other than coercion. It's These are threats backed by actual violence, paid for by money that was taken from people who didn't want to turn it over in the first place. This is such an, a, a key point. So I, I have a conspiracy. The earth is flat. I've got to get a constitutional amendment. Yeah. So I get the government on my side, and the government then uses its power to coerce everyone to sign on to the constitutional amendment. Well, I mean, this this. Uh, let me just give you a concrete that actually did happen. You mentioned flat earth, but there was an attempt to teach creationism as science in the public schools. And I'm speaking here to you as a believer here. I believe God made the world. So I'm saying to you that that was inappropriate in a state school setting to teach it directly as science. I don't think it's wrong to teach it, 
I think actually could be valuable in a given, in a given way that we won't get into today. But the point is, there were people who sought government power for that purpose. Yes, that was an open conspiracy. With it, because <laughs> yeah, they wanted coercion used on their behalf. They wanted those yes. tax dollars directed to something they wanted to do, and they wanted to compel the teachers in those rooms to teach it to a variety of students who may or may not be uh, believers. So the that when did this yeah. become a, a human respect violation? The second that we decide that we need to use force to get our point across. The gotcha. second that we okay. want to start using tax dollars, the second that we start want to start directing, writing uh, bureaucratic regulation on government employees to make them do a certain type of thing, and then we're going to make it affect a wide range of the population. They all have to sit through that. Could could this not go both ways though? I mean, we it goes we, all ways. That's what I'm saying. It's all parties, yeah. all the time. Every you name me a political party, you name me a caucus inside that party, I probably can identify for you what their conspiracy theories are. Makes but sense. You okay, but you can't then say because I believe this, the state has to impose it. That's not sufficient. Okay, it's I'm with you on this. Of, this is a violation of human respect. If it were a good enough idea, you wouldn't need the state to enforce it. And if you wanted to get something done, you could choose to get together with other people voluntarily to get that achieved. There we go. Yes. I so see. the principle of human respect says that anytime we use coercion, we're diminishing happiness, harmony, and prosperity. And so I am suggesting practice human respect. Your conspiracy theory, your conspiracy theory should not be the basis of coercing, coercing others. So those are my four my four uh, pieces of advice on how to handle conspiracies. Now, I'm not going to wrap this up in the way that we normally do, where I say something, where I look straight into the camera and I, you know, hit the bell. Right. What I want to say here and now to wrap up, Bill, is that I intend for an epi this episode and others to follow, where we begin to discuss kind of a philosophy of conspiracy to be kind of an evergreen in nature. Because the fact of the matter is there are certain things we do have to address that are real. And, and I would go one step further and say, even if they weren't, even if I was wrong, having done the homework on this, even if I was wrong, it is, it is important to recognize that conspiracies, conspiracy theories exist. There are conspiracy practices and conspiracy theories. They both exist as part of our national discussion. And we need to get better and more mature about how to address and handle them. I do not hold somebody who feels powerless as responsible for their errant beliefs as I hold people who are more equipped, more secure. For the, for the way the they low hierarchy, for, you know? Yeah, for the way they behave towards people who are who are suffering some kind of psychosis at the moment, some kind of insecurity at the moment. I do not do that. Moreover, I have noticed that people who tend to poo-poo conspiracy theories the most, the most, I'm only talking about one slice of people here, the people who mock and ridicule them the most are, are mean, capricious, and psychologizing. They, they, they look at other people and they start making assumptions about their character, their mental abilities, and a whole bunch of other things. And instead of treating these people like human beings and speaking to them in a real way about what it is that they believe, they immediately express uh, mockery, derision, and, and they try to guess at the psychology of, of these people as opposed to dealing with the facts that they presented. See, if you're going to try to talk somebody out of their conspiracy, you should try the truth as well. Right. If the truth is on your side, you shouldn't have any uh, um, resistance to doing so. Now, I understand not wanting to have a conversation at some point. There are, if someone's completely impervious to evidence, you've got a life, you've got things to do. Not everything is your responsibility to fix and unwind. But before you think to start attacking somebody for the things that they believe, think about whether or not you could actually refute what they said in an effective way, in a polite, decent, gracious way. And I want to get into that because even if the things that I say turn out to be conspiracy theories instead of conspiracy practices as we go down the road. The way I want you to deal with me, please, because I've changed my mind about a lot of things in my life. 
I would like you to come and tell me what you believe the facts and the truth are. I want you to bring the truth. And I will tell you, if all you're going to do is ridicule me, you've already told me I don't have to listen to you. You don't have any arguments. You just don't like me. So let's try to do something better than that. How's that for a place to end?